This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. And with that, we say welcome to our home away from home. So glad you decided to join us for another edition of the Georgia Fire Monitor. I am Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Today we're celebrating a major milestone, 40 years of Sunbelt Expo. Coming up, who took home the honor of being named the Swisher Sweet Southeastern Farmer of the Year? John Holcomb reports on that for us. Also on the program, it's a title she holds with high regard and honor. A conversation with Miss Rodeo USA, Brittany Howard. How she's using her platform to make a big difference. Plus, we're giving you a head start on Thanksgiving planning. Today we answer the million dollar question, what to do with all that leftover bird? Meals from the field and more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, needless to say, it was quite the birthday celebration as the Sunbelt Ag Expo celebrated its 40th year of existence recently. And while it's true that time changes many things, something that never changes is the importance and significance of the annual Willie B. Withers Luncheon. That is where Swisher Sweets announces their annual Southeast Farmer of the Year Award and honors those who have made an impact on farming and agriculture in general. Our John Holcomb made the trip to Moultrie and has the story. Some of the best farmers in the southeast, along with hundreds of others who support them, gathered in the Mall Aircraft Building for the annual Willie B. Withers Luncheon. The event brings many dignitaries from Georgia and also from other southeastern states to highlight agriculture and, of course, the farmers that make it possible. We say this often, that agriculture makes life better for, for every Georgian every day, but Sunbelt makes life better for every farmer every day. They, they can come, this, a, this gathering of the agriculture family, is just a, it's always a spectacle and something to look forward to. Of course, the main event for the luncheon was the naming of this year's Swisher Sweets Sunbelt Expo Southeastern Farmer of the Year. The award is a very prestigious honor that recognizes all the good work these farmers do on and off the farm. It's a great program. It has a twofold mission. Number one, to recognize excellence in agriculture. Number two, to bring recognition to the American farmers, the ones in the southeast that are near and dear in our, to our hearts, that continue to produce a safe, abundant, economical supply of food, fiber, and shelter in the world. What a supply that's often taken for granted. One by one, the winners from each of the 10 states that participated were recognized and given a trophy. This year, the farmer from Georgia was Mr. Everett Williams, a dairy producer in Madison, Georgia. It was a very special honor to win the Georgia Farmer Year. Um, it's kind of just putting out there what, what we all farmers do is work hard to protect the land and to make it better for the next generation. And to find out there's, there's nine more counterparts across the southeast that, that have your aspirations, it's, it's really thrilling and like. Out of all these farmers, though, there can only be one farmer win the big title. This year's Southeastern Farmer of the Year winner was Mr. Robert Mills, Jr. from Virginia. Mills is a beef cattle and chicken producer, which he has been doing now for 19 years. Just a very good, diversified, productive, environmentalist, um, community-oriented, started from scratch with nothing, motivated in the eighth grade by an um, FFA teacher to get him started into farming and has overcome so many obstacles along the way. A trophy is not the only thing Mr. Mills received. As the Southeastern Farmer of the Year, he also racked up a lot of other prizes. Mills received $15,000 cash from Swisser Sweets, the use of a Massey Ferguson tractor for a year from Massey Ferguson North America, and a few other prizes. It's just great to, to honor our farmers who really and truly would prefer to just plant the seed, till the soil, plant the seed, nurture the seed, keep the weeds out, keep the insects off of it, keep it watered and harvested at the end. But when they come to this show and participate in this program, we truly thank them for what they do to provide that food, fiber, and shelter for the world. It's important to recognize our farmers because they're out there working hard and they exemplify American farmers each and every day all across America. And for, to be able to recognize them for their hard work, uh, that they've met all the adversities in life and they've really shown the, the true grit it takes to be, be in business for yourself and to be in American agriculture. Reporting in Moultrie for the Georgia Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. 
All right, John, great job, sir. Well, we heard from him briefly. As for the 2017 Georgia Farmer of the Year, his constant focus on new technology and yearly success has earned Everett Williams high praise amongst his peers. Here now, the story of this incredible man who started with just a small dairy operation and is now considered one of the top producers in the state. I'm Everett Williams. I'm the Sunbelt Expo Georgia Farmer of the Year. Just glad to have y'all here this morning. We are a family farm, family dairy. Uh, we're in the third generation. I have two sons that are back in business with me and we milk cows for a living. I was definitely born into the business. I was born in, uh, daddy started milking cows in 58 when he was a cotton farmer and changed over to milking cows. And when I was growing up, uh, we milked 50 cows and then we progressed to 100 cows and when I came back, I finished University of Georgia in 74, went and worked at a dairy till 78, and came back here and we went from 100 cows to 150. And then since then, we just continue adding cows and we've added family. This last major increase from about 1,000 to 1,700 cows was after both boys had finished college and they'd come back and were committed to staying in the dairy business. It's tremendous. I mean, what better legacy can you have than have sons and daughters, both our daughters are somewhat involved, just not full time, that, that are willing to, to share your dream. It's great. In 2012, we acquired a piece of land that allowed us to expand, and the boys and I decided we needed to milk more cows than what we were milking, and needed a better way to milk, and we chose a rotary parlor. It has two very good attributes. One is the cows like to get on it to be milked, which is very big, but they willingly walk and get up on it and be milked three times a day. And also, cows are creatures of habit. So we have one man that preps the udder, the next man puts the machine on, and then one man dips the cow's teats in a sanitizing solution when they're finished milking. And those three people stay in one spot pretty much, and therefore the cows are milked in a very routine manner, which is good for them. We got sand that uh, we replenish three times a week. It takes about 50 pounds of sand a day to bed a cow. Uh, the stalls are cooled with, wet, uh, with fans and water. We actually pump water on the back for about a minute out of every five to help cool them off, and then the fan blowing air on them just cools them even more. The whole idea is keep them comfortable, they'll eat more feed, they'll be more productive, they'll be more healthy. All of our cows actually have a Fitbit on them. It keeps up with the activity and the rumination, which helps you pinpoint when to breed cows and whether they're uh, moving around okay, and, and whether they're eating the right amount of ration that they need to be productive animals. You know, I think one of our secrets is our attention, attention to detail. We watch after all the little details that get us an extra pound of milk here and there. I, I just like the lifestyle. Um, it's a lot of challenges, always something challenging to do, different, and it just what I've always enjoyed doing. And I get to do most everything, anything from carpentry to driving a tractor to building things, just everything you can think of, I, most physical, I get to do. From all of us here on the show, a huge congratulations to Everett Williams on being a finalist this year. Next week, our coverage from the 40th Sunbelt Ag Expo continues as Ray sits down with equine expert and author Cal Middleton. His passion for the horse industry and why some people have even referred to him as the horse whisperer. Here's a preview. I've been fortunate enough to be around some great people and really uh, tried to let that rub off on me and I try to keep learning as best I can. But I'm working with horses now at a much deeper level than I even really knew existed uh, 10 to 15 years ago, even when I was doing this for a living already. You know, I was teaching, training horses and helping people, but I just keep finding a deeper, higher level of horsemanship as I go. Again, that's renowned horse expert Cal Middleton. You'll see a story next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. And when the monitor continues, our look ahead continues to Thanksgiving. Actually, we're focusing on some post-Thanksgiving recipes using all that leftover turkey. Meals in the Field, it's coming up next. I'm Brittany Howard, Miss Rodeo USA 2017. This ride has been amazing. I don't even know where to start, but 
Uh, it's an amazing journey and you know it all started right here at the Sunbelt Ag Expo and I'm very excited to be back here again um, and the new girl um, for 2017 Sunbelt she's here and she's starting her year too but this year has been amazing and it's just wonderful to come back and see these people and uh, be a role model for so many others in the sport of rodeo and agriculture. My main job is just to promote and market a rodeo so um, companies or committees hire me they bring me into the rodeo and they say hey go out and help promote so that's going to schools it could be visiting nursing homes, children's hospitals, anything that I can do to get out in the community, attend Kiwanis breakfast or luncheons, things like that, organizations is what I do. So I promote and market a rodeo and then go to a rodeo and carry the American flag and sign a lot of autographs and take pictures of kids. My biggest message this year, I have a platform called Staying Focused on the Ride. And what I try to teach others is to stay focused because you can and will achieve your dreams as long as you stay focused and work hard. So if I can do it, you can do it. January 21st is the last night of our IFR and that's when I will pass down the crown to the new girl. So I have about three more months left and I still have a lot to do. So it's not gonna slow down anytime soon. I'm a licensed veterinary technologist, but I do hope to get involved in pharmaceutical sales in the veterinary industry or anything ag-related. I'm willing to branch out and just keep going with my career, and I've met a lot of great connections and people this year, so um, don't know exactly what's in store, but it's going to be great. Well, you know, one of my mottos in life is to always look ahead, plan ahead, because then you're not left thinking, oh, what if or what should I do at the very last minute? And that is exactly what we are doing today. Welcome back to the Georgia Farm Monitor, everybody, and to another edition of Meals from the Field. Joining me as always, my good friend and dear co-host of this lovely program. It's a lovely program. Lovely, not program, but lovely segment called Meals from the Field. Marsha Crowley, yes, today we are looking ahead to Thanksgiving. I know it's October, but a lot of people probably already thinking about the Thanksgiving holiday. Right around the corner. And there's always that question, what do you do with leftovers? Leftover turkey. I always love turkey sandwiches. That's the one of my favorite parts of Thanksgiving. But sometimes they can be bland, and you're actually, you, you have a way to jazz it up yep. today. Yeah, we've got two things. We're doing a turkey lasagna, okay. uh, turkey Mexican enchilada, lasagna, whatever, and a turkey panini, which is a fancy word for a grilled cheese. Okay, so let's okay. show us First what thing. you got. This is the Mexican enchilada stuff. This is a, you pour in a half a can of red enchilada sauce, and I left it in the can so you know what it looks like, because I had to look for it in the grocery store. Okay. Okay, half a can of red enchilada sauce in the bottom of a, this is a seven by 11 dish, but you can, anything that'll fit, okay? Go back to that, then you've got flour, tortillas, and corn I think would be too mushy, mm -hmm. and whole wheat probably wouldn't hold up as well. So you've got four, put four of these in the bottom and you're gonna overlap them. A layer of these, like this. All right, then you're gonna combine, move that, two and a half cups of leftover cooked turkey. Does it matter if I see red or? No, it doesn't okay. matter, now. Nah. Try, if you can get a round thing in a square peg, go for it. Okay. Okay. That's just my OCD kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I That's see good. red. Uh, I'm sure somebody else saw the same thing. Okay. All right, I've added to the um, cooked turkey a half a teaspoon of cumin and a half a teaspoon of coriander, but if you don't like those spices, just leave them out. Okay. A can of black beans, drained and rinsed, or everything will be black if you don't do that. A small can of chopped green chilies, which I could actually, I could live on these things they're so good and two tablespoons of fresh cilantro and if you don't like cilantro some people don't leave it out all right you're just gonna mix all that up then you're gonna spread half of this on top of these tortillas can we just eat that with I chips? know this is yeah you could it's so good <laughs> Half of this mixture, and because of the timing, we're going to pretend that's half. I'm still seeing some red, Marsha. I know. Well, you won't at the end. <laughs> um, it calls for two cups of sharp cheddar 
or Mexican cheese. So we're okay. going to put a cup, half of that, over this. I was going to ask you, so you could also use that Mexican cheese That's blend what this that you is. use on tacos? Yeah, okay. for the Mexican. Or you could use Monterey Jack or Pepper Jack. or Just no Swiss. I wouldn't do Swiss nah, on Mexican no Swiss. now. I wouldn't do Swiss on that. Okay. And then this is one cup of sour cream with two tablespoons of salsa added to okay. it. Just add a little more flavor. And put half of that on this. Let me get some over there so you don't see red. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, then you're going to pour the rest of the enchilada sauce over that. And this is leftover? I mean, this, this is, is leftover awesome. turkey, yeah. Wow. All right, then you're going to top it with the remainder of these. There's our buzzer so we can have this for lunch. Very nice. I think we should just cut the film right now there we and go. start eating. How's that, Ray? Good? I like it. Good? I like it. Okay, then you're going to top it with the rest of the chicken mixture, um, the rest of the cheese mixture, okay. and the sour cream, and you're going to bake it for 350. And there is the finished product. And it is product. so good. Look at that. It's really good. I think you'll, it's a really good use for leftover turkey. Now the panini. The panini. All right, let me go ahead and turn this on. Well, I'm not going to hit you with that pan. Thank you very much. Okay, all this is, and like I said, a panini is a fancy word for a grilled cheese sandwich. Mm -hmm. It's French. All right, we've got um, sabata bread, which if you, a loaf bread works better than like sliced white bread or wheat bread. We've got a little bit of mayo, um, cheese on there. We are going to, this is smoked Gouda, layer two, two slices of smoked Gouda. Mm -hmm. um, your leftover turkey, and my hands are clean, I promise. And if you can use white or dark, you know, you know what to do with that. Then we are going to add, this is a blueberry jam. Okay. Okay, and the recipe will be on the website. It's very mm -hmm. basic, takes no time. And if you don't like this, you can leave that off. Sprinkle a little bit of that on there, just to give it a little bite. Red onion, a little bit of red onion, and some spinach. And here again, you can add whatever ingredients you like. If you don't like any of these, switch them out. Let's see what side this goes on. Here we go. Then you're just going to put it on your grill pan. We've got a little butter in there. And if you don't have a panini press, which a lot of people don't, and that did not come on, so we're going to have to pretend, you can use a cast iron skillet. Very nice. Okay. And what if you don't have a cast iron skillet? Well, you ne we need something that's heavy okay. to put on there. And you just put that on top and let it grill. Like How about a barbell weight? A barbell weight would be good. Some I'll people use a those. brick with foil all over it. <laughs> there you go. And you just grill this like two or three minutes on each side. Mm -hmm. You flip it, do the same on the other. And, and we it got is the finished product there as well. Really, really good. You gotta love the griddle marks as well. That's oh yeah, makes it look like I'm a professional. But you are a professional. So, <laughs> and as Marcia mentioned, folks, you can find these recipes by logging on to gfb.org/recipes. Again, these are leftovers, things leftovers. that you can do with your leftover turkey. I'm sure every single year at this time, you're wondering how the heck you're gonna. Uh, you know, get rid of all those leftovers. Well, now you know because of Marsha. So, Marsha, as always. Thank you, Ray. Thank you so much. So good to see you. Kenny, we'll go ahead and send it back to you. Ray and Marsha, thank you so much. Time for our final break. When we come back, Charles Denny on how a little plot of land can still be a successful agricultural enterprise. Stay tuned. On a rainy day when the remnants of Hurricane Irma blow through, this goat herd smartly prefers a barn instead of a field, though a few hungry souls ventured out to pasture. This Hickman County farm is just 33 acres, about half in forage and half in pretty woods, but that works just fine for these animals. I cross them back and forth. Uh, they love to go in. Uh, every so many weeks I let them in to eat the leaves and small bushes and then back over on the grass side uh, in the meantime. So I have both sides producing something. Taniel Tyner says goat farming is like a hobby where she makes a little money. She raises a mix of meat and milk goats, 37 head in all, including this beauty named Wild Thing. And then you pull it this way toward your herd. Tyner used funds from a Tennessee Department of Agriculture enhancement grant to build this catch pen and hay barn. For her, overall herd health is a priority. 
The biggest problem with raising goats is um, parasites. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, having being able to put them up and catch them, uh, check their eyelids and their gums is what we look at for health. Small ruminant production has certainly become more advanced in modern day farming. It used to be we'd just turn animals loose to eat whatever they wanted. Now a smart producer is concerned with nutrition and marketing. They're looking at this to, to uh, certainly to make, to make some money. So when, when they're doing that in this opportunity now, the market's pretty good. UT Extension's Troy Duggar has seen a spike in the number of goat and sheep producers in Hickman County in recent years. The hills and hollows in these parts make this type of agriculture possible. The way our land is here, uh, it is well suited for all kinds of livestock and especially on some small acreage type things for, uh, for goat producers and, and uh, sheep producers as well. Duggar will soon lead a UT and TSU Extension Master Small Ruminant Workshop where producers can learn about forage, food safety, and genetics. Small animals on just a little land. It's a combination that works here, and smart herd management is key to its continued success. This is Charles Denny reporting. In his latest Beyond the Fence Rose column, American Farm Bureau Federation President Zippy Duvall writes, Thanks to scientific innovation in agriculture, farmers and ranchers are using fewer resources to grow an abundant, sustainable food supply. But I wonder how far our new technology and techniques will take us if farmers are left without one of the most critical resources to keep our farms sustainable, a stable workforce. As we all know, the need for labor in the ag industry is at an all-time high. And with the demand for fresh, locally grown food increasing daily, that need has many producers calling for immediate change. American Farm Bureau's Kerry Barbick shares the story of one couple who, like many farmers, may have to scale back production or, worst case scenario, go out of farming altogether. We got my, my tractor in back here disking up our, our 20 acre zucchini field. This field, we had, to, we had to abandon it about six weeks ago because we don't have enough help. For Burr and Rosella Mosby, a shortage of workers is threatening the future of their vegetable farm just south of Seattle. We are going to lose an easy $100,000 out here. And it's all because we don't have enough people to harvest our crops. The Mosby say a major roadblock standing between them and accessing a stable workforce is the current guest worker visa program. I think we need more options. We have a three generation family that works on our first generation farm. And we almost have a sister like community with their community in Mexico. They farm there themselves. There's an availability there, but yet not the availability of visas for those people to come to work on our farm. Osvaldo Salazar is the second in three generations of Salazars working with Mosby Farms. I feel bad because I lost a lot of products, I lost cucumber fields, lost zucchini fields, and I feel bad because I got it so many years working and I feel like it's part of my life in here. It's too bad getting nice stuff and let it go. We're in America. You're supposed to work hard and, and be able to produce something and get paid at the end of the day. Here we produce something, we grew it, and I don't have enough hands to help me pick it and put it in a box and sell it to the grocery stores. That's what hurts. Carrie Barbic, American Farm Bureau. Very good story. Thank you very much, Carrie. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info that regards food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us at the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week.